Are we ready? Ready. Um, good morning or afternoon with everyone. Buenos dias o buenas tardes con todos ustedes. Welcome to the webinar, Death for Nature to Save the Amazon. Bienvenidos al webinar de canje de deuda para salvar la Amazonía. This event is co-sponsored by the Center for Human Rights and Environment, the Institute for Governance and Sustainable Development, and Stand Earth. Este evento ha sido auspiciado por el Centro de Derechos Humanos y Ambiente, el Instituto para la Gobernanza y Desarrollo Sostenible, y Stand Earth. Antes de comenzar, me gustaría presentar las instrucciones para habilitar la interpretación. Um, before we start, I would like to share the instructions for turning on interpretation. Um, on the Zoom bar, you will find um, the interpretation globe on your screen. Please click on this uh, icon and this menu will be displayed. If you're bilingual, you might as well just turn off your, uh, the interpretation tool. Um, and then please uh, uh, click the language for which you would like to hear the audio. The last step is to meet the original audio so you'll have a, a great experience with uh, the interpretation. Um, eh, con respecto a las instrucciones para la interpretación, en primer lugar les voy a pedir que revisen que en su barra de Zoom eh, tengan el icono de interpretación que es este globo que aparece en su pantalla y está en la barra de Zoom. El siguiente paso, eh, una vez que ustedes hagan clic en este icono, le, se va a desplegar este menú. En caso de que ustedes sean bilingües y no necesiten interpretación, pueden marcar como apagado. Y, en, eh, eh, y si no, pueden escoger el idioma en el cual quieren escuchar el audio. Finalmente, les pedimos eh, para que mejoren su experiencia con la interpretación, que eh, silencien el, el audio original también. Eh, con esto dicho, eh, me voy a permitir, en caso de que existieran, perdón, antes, eh, preguntas sobre la interpretación, eh, les vamos a pedir que las incluyan en el chat del, del webinar. Eh, quiero comenzar, um, uh, I would like to start this, uh, this webinar introducing our moderator, Sephora Berman. Sephora has been designing environmental campaigns and working on environmental policy in Canada. Um, and beyond for over 20 years. She currently is an international program director at Stand Earth. She's an adjunct professor of York University Faculty of Environmental Studies, the co-founder of the Global Oil and Gas Network, and the chair of the Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty Initiative. With all this said, welcome to Sephora. Thank you so much, Alicia, and welcome everyone joining us online here at Climate Week and also on Facebook Live. I want to, um, first of all, again, recognize and thank uh, our co-host Center for Human Rights and Environment and Climate Change, the Institute for Governance and Sustainable Development, and the team at Stand Earth um, for putting together uh, this important conversation the pandemic crisis has caused, as we all know, a global contraction of economic activity, deepening the debt crisis already afflicting many countries and causing adverse impacts for hundreds of millions of people around the world, especially of the global south. In the Amazon region, many countries are under pressure to address the crisis, to service their rising debt obligations by accelerating the extraction of fossil fuels minerals, timber, timber, and other commodities. This in turn is increasing the pressures on the Amazon as home to an enormous cultural diversity and the most biologically diverse ecosystem on the planet. In response to the current crisis, there are growing international calls for a suspension or cancellation of debt repayments along with efforts to strengthen public health out outcomes, address social and economic inequality, to tackle the climate and ecological crises as part of an effort to build back better. Debt relief strategies are a vital solution for maintaining the ecosystem intactness that is so important for addressing climate change, the maintenance of biodiversity, for upholding the rights of indigenous peoples and supporting their cultural survival. 
So this panel will explore issues arising from the current international crisis, the particular challenges facing the Amazon region and the potential for solutions that address interests of its people and safeguard the Amazon's contribution to the health and well-being of the earth and its climate. These issues have implications and this conversation has implications though, not only for the Amazon, but for many regions around the world. Last year, we saw with the first release of the production gap report by the United Nations Environmental Program, Stockholm Environment Institute and others that we are currently on track to produce 120% more oil, gas and coal than the world can safely burn under a 1.5 degree scenario. What this, what is now being called the production gap must be addressed if we are going to ensure the protection of biodiversity and a safe climate. And of course, especially in the Amazon and many other regions in the world, the human rights of indigenous people. How we do that for countries that are under increasing pressure uh, to continue to drill and mine um, is a huge outstanding question. We're very lucky today to have an incredible panel of people, of experts from around the world and specifically experts who have experience in the Amazon basin to discuss these issues. So today we're going to hear from Ulrich Voltz, Director of the Center for Sustainable Finance, um, University of London. And we were planning on hearing from Tuntiak Katan from COICA, the Pan-Amazonic Organization of Indigenous Federations. Unfortunately, uh, Tuntiak is still struggling uh, with um, and is ill uh, as a result of uh, COVID-19 uh, and we wish him and his family very uh, well at this very difficult time. We're going to hear uh, also today from Carlos Larea, a professor of Universidad Adino Semien Bolivar, Ecuador, from Romino Piccolotti, President of the Center for Human Rights and Environment and Climate Change, Senior Advisor at the Institute for Governance and Sustainable Development. Eric Lecomte, Executive Director of Jubilee USA Network. And finally, Kevin Gallagher, Professor at Boston University Pardee School of Global Studies and Director of Boston University Global Development Policy Center. An incredible lineup. We're going to get right to it. I just want to remind people that there is a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen at any time. Please list questions that you might have for any of our presenters. We will try and address them in real time and we'll also uh, bring them forward after we hear from each of our speakers and have uh, a moderated discussion based on the questions that you've posed. So please uh, do use that Q&A. And again, thank you so much for joining us a very busy week at Climate Week this, week, this year online. Um, and, and for those of you joining us on Facebook Live, um, thank you very much for joining us. We will also be trying to pull your questions um, into the conversation after we hear from our first speaker, now after we hear from our speakers. So again, um, as we heard from Alicia, uh, if you are uh, Spanish speaking, um, our presentations today will be in English. Please uh, note that at the bottom of your screen, you will see a small uh, globe, uh, there you can turn on uh, translation for yourself. Without further ado, I turn the floor over to Ulrich Voltz. Thank you, Ulrich. Thank you, Tipora, and uh, thanks Alicia and everyone for organizing this. Really a pleasure to, to be joining this conversation. Um, so I've been asked to, to provide a bit of a, a background for the conversation and indeed, Chipora has already uh, uh, laid uh, um, out the main points, but uh, let, me, let me highlight why it is so important that we talk about climate action in these times of debt distress. Uh, Alisa, if you could please move on to the next slide. So we are already uh, in a deep economic crisis, and um, we have a huge global debt crisis looming. Already before uh, the COVID-19 pandemic uh, broke out, large parts of the global South were struggling with uh, 
huge piles of debt. The IMF and the World Bank in their uh, regular assessments uh, assessed that um, almost half of the lower income countries were at high risk or already in debt distress. Uh, and of course, uh, with economic collapse during the pandemic, things have become much, much worse. And uh, we're still, we still don't know where the bottom end is of, of the crisis, but uh, we've seen uh, steep declines in uh, outputs. And at the same time, governments had to step up, uh, uh, ratchet up fiscal spending to support uh, population, try to keep health systems afloat, uh, try to secure jobs and so on. And this has uh, caused big uh, um, holes in, in public finances. And uh, so there will also be uh, enormous amounts needed uh, to finance recoveries. And uh, so this is uh, putting public finances across the board uh, into difficult positions, but uh, for many developing countries which were really struggling already before and where the uh, debt capacity is very low, um, this is really dramatic. Um, UMTAT uh, put out some estimates uh, that suggest that uh, public external debt that need to be serviced uh, this year and next year are in the order of magnitude between two and a half and three and a half trillion US dollars. So big amounts of money that need to be spent while uh, governments are facing urgent needs on uh, spending on, on um, uh, stabilizing the situation, health systems, and so on. Um, there have also been some estimates suggesting that um, large piles of um, outstanding sovereign external debt uh, will be defaulted on uh, over the next coming months. And we have already seen, uh, 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 for example, just this week, uh, Zambia uh, defaulting uh, on its external debt and uh, many, many more uh, will be following for sure. Uh, please, the next slide. And this debt crisis is unfolding while, of course, we are also facing another uh, crisis which is uh, no less dramatic, uh, and that is the climate crisis. Climate scientists are very clear that we have very, very little time left to, to um, uh, bring down carbon emissions, move towards um, low carbon or zero carbon economies uh, to prevent catastrophic climate change. All of us, we, we are seeing almost on a daily basis how uh, the current impacts of climate change are already playing out. Uh, be it forest fires in uh, uh, California or um, uh, uh, floods in Pakistan and all around the world. You have all the time examples of, of how dramatic the situation already is. And this is uh, still kind of the start. So there is a very, very urgent need for large scale spending in adaptation uh, in all countries. Uh, but especially in developing countries, to climate-proof uh, societies and economies and make them more resilient to the effects of climate change we will be seeing anyway, uh, even if we um, will end up with a benign 1.5 centigrade scenario. Um, and of course, if, if we're moving towards two degree or three degree worlds, um, much, much more investment will be needed in adaptation. And so we, we have a very urgent pressure to scale up investment in adaptation. Uh, and of course, we also have a huge need to scale up uh, investment in mitigation. Uh, so we need to uh, change our en energy structure and so on. Um, and uh, uh, the problem is that um, uh, there is really very, very little time um, to move on with climate action. Um, we're also uh, facing other pressing environmental problems. Um, biodiversity loss is also uh, continuing at very rapid pace. And again, uh, this is something that needs to be addressed very urgently because otherwise um, uh, we will uh, face 
uh, extinction from, from this uh, direction, and um, uh, this can not be reversed either. So um, we have around a decade um, to avoid catastrophic climate change and also address the problem of biodiversity loss. However, uh, and if you could please move to the next slide, it's going to be very unlikely that we will see any meaningful climate action, both on the mitigation and adaptation side, and also in protecting um, uh, biodiversity and so on, um, if countries are bogged down uh, by debt crisis. And as uh, Chipora indicated in her intro statement, there is actually a big risk that uh, financial pressures will drive countries, governments, uh, to extract uh, natural resources um, as much as they can so that they can keep the cash flowing. So um, not only is the debt crisis undermining the capacity uh, to proactively, uh, proactively invest in climate adaptation, mitigation, um, environmental protection, uh, but also um, it is creating incentives uh, to do exactly the opposite um, and, and worsen the crisis even more. So uh, this is basically uh, the dilemma that we're facing. And of course, um, we must not forget in all this uh, that the current crisis is also a huge um, uh, humanitarian tragedy. In many parts of the world, um, poverty levels are rising again and many countries simply don't have the means to, to provide social safety nets. So um, we have this huge debt crisis, the climate crisis, the biodiversity crisis, and also huge social crisis. And all of that, uh, we cannot uh, treat separately. We need to um, uh, think about these things um, in a unified framework, and we need to discuss significant debt relief uh, so that we can have uh, meaningful investment, uh, public investment from governments uh, to address each of these problems. So we do need uh, a global effort at debt relief. Um, and if you could please move on to the next slide. And it's really important, I believe, to emphasize that we're dealing here with a systemic problem. So uh, we are not just looking at debt crises in a country here and a country there. Um, this is going to be a massive uh, debt crisis across the global south. Uh, of course, also many countries in, in the uh, global north are uh, feeling fiscal pressures, but it's a different story. So uh, we're looking at a massive, massive debt crisis across the global south uh, with many countries um, that will be struggling. And with this systemic problem, we also need a systemic solution. So I don't think uh, we can be just looking at a, a couple of uh, uh, debt for climate swaps here or there. Uh, we need to think about some systemic solutions uh, that really help to deliver large scale debt relief uh, for a large number of countries, uh, while at the same time making sure uh, that the relief is used in a way uh, that will help to address the uh, uh, social problems, uh, the environmental problems, um, and the climate problems. So um, this is kind of my, my uh, overview intro, and I'm very much looking forward to uh, hear the contributions of the others, and of course, and move on to um, a discussion on how uh, we can move forward with this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I, I know I am going to to present a specific proposal uh, to uh, mitigate climate change and avoid biodiversity loss, two of the most important problems that the humankind is facing now, coming from a small Amazon country which is Ecuador. 
Well, can I go ahead, please? Yeah, okay. So, uh, let's begin with a brief uh, review of the global significance of the Amazon rainforest. The Amazon does not belong only to Brazil, does not belong only to Amazon countries. It has part of the world heritage and has a lot of functions that allow the, the planet uh, uh, to, to provide uh, all the environmental service we need. First, uh, the Amazon is the largest remaining rainforest in the planet. Secondly, uh, is the most important uh, reservoir of uh, biodiversity. It's holding more than 3 million species, which uh, represent about 10% of all the species in, in the world. At the same time, the rainforest stores about uh, 150 billion tons of carbon. So it's a key, very, very important part of the contribution uh, to uh, fight climate change. Uh, the Amazon uh, basin concentrates uh, one fifth of all available global fresh water. Uh, finally, uh, the Amazon fulfills a very, very important uh, function in uh, regulating rains and humidity all over uh, South America. So if the rainforest disappears or is seriously threatened, all the climate and food production in the region can collapse. Finally, that's very important. Uh, there are about 350 indigenous peoples living in the Amazon, and their survival might be also threatened. Next, please. However, but the Amazon is very fragile. Here, I'm going to present uh, some of uh, of the most important problems the Amazon is facing now. Uh, now we have already lost about a fifth, maybe a sixth or a fifth of the original rainforest cover due to mostly to deforestation. Deforestation is the result of uh, several problems, large scale, scale agriculture, cattle raising, mostly in Brazil and Bolivia, oil, gas and mining, Oil is important in Ecuador, Peru, mining in Brazil and Peru, gas in Peru, the construction of very large infrastructure projects, mostly in Brazil, Peru, Ecuador, new settlements from uh, poor migrants, Ecuador, Peru, Colombia, forest fire, which has been extremely serious in the last two years, particularly in Peru, in, uh, in Brazil and Bolivia, and above all, climate change. Next, please. The, the problem is that uh, the combined effect of all uh, these threats is uh, uh, creating a situation in which rainforests can collapse. Uh, we are about to reach, according to recent research, a tipping point in which a process, a self-sustained natural process of savanization because of lack of humidity, lack of rain, and at the same time, increasing temperature can be unleashed, uh, threatening at least 30 to 60% of the current Amazon rainforest. It can create a very serious problem worldwide uh, affecting the, uh, both climate change and biodiversity loss. That's what most uh, scientists, uh, scientific, recent scientific research are telling us. That's, that's why it's extremely important to uh, consolidate a, a combined action to save the Amazon rainforest. Next, please. Here, I am going to, to present a proposal that comes uh, from uh, uh, an academic research group of several institutions. The, our objective is to present a proposal both to Ecuador and the international community for a debt for nature swap in Ecuador. 
Uh, I'm going to specifically uh, talk about Ecuador. Ecuador is a very small country. It has a, a, a small fraction of the Amazon rainforest. Nevertheless, the most important biodiversity hotspots in the region are located in Ecuador. Uh, secondly, uh, the country has been very affected by oil expansion, which has led to uh, deforestation and biodiversity loss, as you can see in the, in the attached uh, map about the Ecuadorian Amazon. Uh, the Ecuador, however, uh, in spite of uh, having extracting oil for about uh, 50 years, uh, it's facing a very, very deep crisis that began in 2014 uh, when the collapse of oil uh, prices took place. Now, COVID is worsening the crisis, so we are elaborating a debt for conservation swap with China that can first stop deforestation, provide the needed economic relief in the short term, and foster a transition away from fossil fuels, particularly oil, to a resilient and more equitable uh, development path for the country. Next, please. Here, uh, next, please. I'm going next. Uh, well, here we have uh, 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 some statistical information about the huge increase in foreign debt that Ecuador um, has uh, because the short term most significant way to avoid the crisis uh, in the last year has been increasing foreign debt. Now the situation seems to be almost out of the control. That's why the country is uh, beginning to, to uh, promote different uh, ways uh, for debt uh, relief, for debt renegotiation. Uh, so far, some of these measures uh, have been successful. Nevertheless, uh, they have the risk of deepening oil dependence. For example, the country is the government is negotiating now a debt uh, pre-sale of oil which can increase oil dependence in the country. The country has a very limited oil reserve remaining. Next, please. Here we have uh, the effects. This is a per capita GDP in Ecuador since uh, 1950 to present. Uh, you can see the last year since uh, two, uh, two, uh, 2014, we are facing a very, very deep crisis. Per capita GDP is going to drop this year by about 9% for the combined effect of the crisis and the COVID problem. So that's why the country needs a redesign, a deep analysis about its current development paths. Next, please. This contribution, this proposal for a debt for a conservation swap with China. Uh, will be uh, specific in the following. Uh, uh, China is the largest bilateral, uh, has the largest bilateral share of Ecuadorian debt with a total of, uh, of about $6 billion. We propose uh, $807 million uh, debt for conservation swap. The idea is that Ecuador will commit itself to an 80% reduction in deforestation in the next 10 years. It will first save about 225 million tons of carbon dioxide emissions in the next years, and will avoid uh, the deforestation of about uh, uh, 388,000 hectares of rainforest. Uh, the, the main question you, you, you can ask is, are, uh, the, is this proposal uh, reliable? Is this proposal feasible to be fulfilled? Fortunately, in the Amazon, we have a very successful experience during the former uh, Brazilian government. Um, between 2004 and 2012, under the leading of Marina Silva in Brazil, this country has been able to reduce deforestation by about 80 percent, 85 percent, 
uh, in this eight year period. So Brazil uh, sets up uh, a, a very co coherent and successful strategy based on satellite monitoring, international cooperation, a proper legislation and law enforcement and conservation incentives, local conservation incentives uh, to uh, reduce deforestation. So the proposal is feasible, it can be done, and it can provide a very important step uh, towards addressing the two most important problems that humankind and the Amazonian region is facing, climate change and deforestation laws. Next, please. Here we have uh, an analysis about how many hectares can be saved in the 10 year period in the future. We have two paths, the, the implementation of, uh, of the swap, uh, business as usual. Next, please. So uh, to end, uh, I would like uh, to, to present uh, the real dilemma that Ecuador is facing. Some Latin American countries might uh, try to dip extractivist, uh, the extractivist model as a short-term uh, reply to the crisis. Uh, for example, in the case of Ecuador, uh, the, the idea will be increasing oil extraction uh, uh, to foster oil pre-sales, particularly with China, and expanding large-scale mining in the Amazon. Uh, nevertheless, uh, the country has very small reserves of both oil and metal uh, minerals. So, uh, this uh, reply may, in addition to a very high uh, social and environmental cost, might not be feasible. The second option can be you can begin can begin with a debt renegotiation. Um, the uh, promotion of these debt for conservation swaps uh, by imply the total elimination of current uh, fossil fuel subsidies. And finally, uh, to foster a strategy of reducing deforestation and keeping fossil fuel reserve and exploited in the future, uh, particularly in mega diverse reserves such as the Yasuni National Park. Thank you very much uh, for listening. Fantastic. Thank you, Carlos. Um, and I'm so sorry I wasn't there to introduce you. Um, I've, my, I've never had that happen before. Uh, my computer crashed in the middle of moderating this panel, but I'm back. Um, what an uh, ambitious and very important proposal. And also, um, uh, it should be noted, your uh, dedication and persistence on this matter and vision. Um, uh, given the, the long history uh, since the first uh, proposal, the Yusuni ITT proposal, which um, was likely just ahead of its time. Uh, let's hope the time is now. Um, next, i um, excited uh, today that we have uh, Romina Piccolotti. She's a, a senior policy analyst at IGSD, the president and founder of the Center for Human Rights and the Environment. Previously, Ms. Piccolotti was Argentina's Environment Secretary uh, from 2006 to 2008, during which time she implemented successfully a debt for environment uh, swap. Um, very excited uh, to hear from Romina today. The floor is yours. Romina, I think you're muted. Okay, here we go. <laughs> yes. Um, so uh, thank you a lot, Tesora, for the introduction and moderating this panel, and also for Alisa to put this together. An honor to to be in this panel with such experienced um, panelists. So um, I would like to talk today uh, about you know how to how to synchronize uh, the current debt crisis with uh, the sustainability of of the earth. And um, some of the things have been said already. Um, the, the important question that I would like us to, to help answer is what, what to do on a debt global crisis and a climate emergency and how to finance it. 
Um, so please, if we can move to the, to the first slide. Um, so the implementation um, of the relief packages, as I've said by many, will represent the difference between life and death. And this is not only because um, the current uh, pandemic situation is pushing people to poverty um, at an amazing rate. I mean, the World Bank stated that um, 60 million more people are pushed to, to extreme poverty. And at the same time, even before the pandemic, um, the global uh, debt, sovereign debt, reached a record of 253 trillion, trillion last year that represents 322 of global GDP. So as Ulrich was saying, um, the, I mean, a global debt restructuring will happen in, and, um, and we need to be ready to uh, ensure that as we enter in that debt restructuring, we are also taking um, care of, of climate. Um, the fall rates are rising, and um, and yet we know that if we do not take care of the climate emergencies at the same time that we work uh, debt restructuring, uh, all the work that we'll be doing now will be meaning meaningless, as not nobody will be able to pay any debt if the planet um, is immersed in a, in a climate chaos. So therefore, uh, climate stability is a precondition to any economic recovery. And this is why govern, governments and multilateral lenders uh, need to provide better tools uh, to navigate a wave of their restructuring um, in a way that includes uh, climate protection. And this is what we're proposing, uh, we've been proposing in, in the last month. I mean, this is why this tool of debt for climate swap is so, so important. Um, please go to the... Uh, to the next slide. So um, this is the climate emergency. And um, yeah, we do know we are already, um, we're already on extreme weather mode, weather events mode. Um, the last six months, um, we have experienced you know, extreme fires, droughts, floods, um, extreme temperatures in, in Siberia. The Arctic is melting at an unusual uh, rate. And as Tim Linton has, um, has repeatedly told us um, with his team, uh, tipping points are, um, are, are approaching faster and, and they're connected. So to protect the Amazon, um, yes, we need to work on conservation in the Amazon, but we also need to work on keeping the temperature uh, in, a, an, in a level that will not um, unbalance the climate system. Because uh, any conservation, massive conservation, so will, again, will mean anything if we are spiraling in a, in a climate instability. Um, then the next slide, uh, please. So this, this slide uh, shows something that happened actually this week in, um, in New York. And um, the metronome that is a classic of, of New York has been reset to show how much time we have left uh, to remain under 1.5 and to avoid an irreversible climate crisis. And um, this has ba been based on um, the latest research by Berlin Institute. And as you can see, um, it's going down as we speak. Um, but we have mostly about seven years uh, to to be to be able to be to bend the curve and be on track uh, for climate protection. Uh, the next slide, please. So, um, so what um, what to do? So we do know uh, is too risky to bet against the earth. Uh, so there's no other way. Um, for me, it's not a dilemma anymore. You know, there is no other ways for market, for economic, for macroeconomics, um, that to bet in favor of the earth. And um, and on the, for that, we, as I say before, we need to um, understand that we need to remain 
uh, on a temperature that um, that physics tell us uh, can can stabilize the the climate system. And um, to meet the target target goals, we do know that carbon um, global net carbon dioxide emissions need to go down to 45 percent by 2030 and by 100 percent by 2050. And we also know that without fast mitigation to reduce near-term warming, um, the global average temperature are likely to increase um, and exceed uh, 1.5 during 2040. Um, we also know that um, on, the, on contrast, if we do reduce um, methane, black carbon, uh, HFCs, substantially in the next uh, two decades, um, we can provide 0.6 of avoided warming, save 2.4 uh, million uh, lives per, years, per year, and at the same time, uh, save money for consumers through energy efficiency, and, um, and allow, um, avoid 15 million tons of crop losses in agriculture. This is very important because uh, when we're talking about climate actions and what kind of projects we should finance, um, and high priority should be projects that deliver jobs, that deliver uh, health resilience, and at the same time deliver the most temperature abatement in the short term. And obviously protection of sinks and protection of the Amazon is, 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 is one of these priorities in jobs creation. Um, in we, so we do know what we need to do on the, the next decades to keep, um, to keep the, the earth habitable. And we also do know that this is, this is a precondition for, for economics. So um, the question is, how we're going to finance this because according to UNTAD in 2014 already they were estimated that we have a gap on climate mitigation between 2015 and 2030 of 60 per year so we do have not only um, a gap on uh, mitigation uh, action ambition but we also have a gap on, on finance um, we also know um, that putting the world on a 1.5 pathway trajectory will create an additional 150 million jobs. And we also know that we can substantially increase the amount of finance available um, if we incur, um, if we mainstream debt for climate swaps in this wave of debt restructuring negotiation. So can we please go to the, to the next slide? Um, so this is a concept of, of debt for climate swap, but uh, for the people that are not familiar with the concept, um, basically, instead of continuing to make external payments on outstanding loans in hard currency, a debtor country makes payments in local currency to local climate projects on terms agreed upon, upon with creditors. But bearing in mind that we need to use science um, to have the right priorities on what kind of projects uh, they need to be fine, we need to be financed. Next slide, please. Um, so let's, let's move to the way forward principles and implementation. Next slide, please. Um, so as Ulrich was saying, we need um, a global approach. Um, and at the same time, where we're entering maybe on bilateral negotiations, we do need some global approach. So we have put together uh, preliminary principles that can govern uh, this, this kind of debt for, for climate swap. The first one is that debt for climate swap are not, should not be seen as new conditionality to debt relief, but a new form of sovereign debt payment. This is very, very important for the middle e uh, emerging economies, countries. Um, and also because it's completely aligned with the principle of common but differentiated responsibility, which, is, um, is, um, which has been fought hard by the South. Um, 
also principle to avoid being too little too late um that for for natural swaps that for environment swaps in the past in, including the one that we did in argentina that i implemented in argentina it was just a small and marginal portion on the whole debt restructuring renegotiation and that will be insufficient and it will be um, too late to then reverse the course. So we need to ensure that debt for climate swap are not only a mere stream on debt for climate negotiations, but also a substantial amount of uh, debt for climate negotiations and uh, on, on the debt restructuring negotiations. Principle three is, uh, three is incorporate uh, climate risk in debt assessment. This is essential because um, the countries that have accepted debt relief during the pandemic, they were very hit, hard hit by um, creditor agencies that rate sovereign debt. And we do want to uh, break this perverse cycle. I mean, what we do want at the end of the day is that the most that you invest on climate, the better your debt qualifies and not the other way around. And for that, climate risk needs to in, be incorporated in, in debt assessment. The principle four is link debt for climate swap with national climate commitments. Many countries are working on the NDCs right now, and it's very, very important that um, they can put a, a section where you know, fast mitigation strategies uh, enhance ambition condition to debt for climate swap. Uh, so if you're if you're going to increase your ambition 20% uh, more, uh, you can link that with climate uh, for debt swap um, in, a, in a very concrete way. Principle five is set up transparent governance systems to make decisions and track the money. This was important in Argentina implementation of the debt swaps and attract others to the table. Uh, there's a lot of lessons learned there um, that can be applied. Let's move to the next slide, please. Principle six is um, incorporate metrics to evaluate climate and economic impacts, including revenues, jobs creation, um, CO2 equivalent reductions, and temperature abatement. Revenues, as you know, are very important when you talk to Minister of Finance and um, to convince them that this is the way to go. And there will be the ones uh, leading the negotiations um, on debt restructuring is very important that the projects that we put together include revenues as well um, alongside to uh, with job creation and temperature abatement. Principle seven is um, reinvest the revenue to increase climate ambition and this can be done for example by creating a set cyclical fund. Well um, the revenues that you generate with the implementation of the project they come back and you can reuse them uh, to increase climate ambition. Principle A is um, use climate debt swaps to leverage climate finance. Um, this was a good experience as well that um, uh, we did in Argentina. When you have a debt for climate, um, or with debt for environment swap that works, you can sit others at the table and leverage uh, finance. And, so this is an opportunity also uh, to leverage the green environment facility and the green climate funds. Um, principle nine, um, link debt for climate swap with pipeline infrastructure projects that reduce climate risk, create more shops and send consumer money. There again, um, many countries do have a pipelines already of infrastructure projects and it's very important that the prioritization includes uh, climate and mainly when you're um, implementing not only the for climate swap but also um, um, the economic stimulus package principle 10 focus the role of the state on protecting people and not on bailing out fossil fuel companies and other inefficient companies. And I think that's, that's very, very important. This is a moment uh, to create jobs. And uh, we know renewables create more jobs than fossil fuels. Uh, and we do know that fossil fuel are stranded assets, as the Sora was saying at the beginning. So I will be negligent to invest taxpayer money on, on these kind of companies. We'll be negligent with the earth and it will be uh, negligent um, with your own uh, people. 
the implementation. Uh, we do need head of state leadership. Um, this goes back to Ulrich's point about um, this is a, a substantial and um, a structural change and, and not a, a, a marginal thing here and there on, on dev swaps for climate. And, um, and for that, we do need head of state leadership. So um, influence the G20, the G24, uh, the major, major economic forums, the Secretary General Finance for Development, we would like to see out of this process a specific mentions on death for climate swaps um, and a specific commitment maybe with a specific trust fund dedicated to this. And um, IMF, World Bank, Club of Paris, they all have their own leadership in their uh, in the role. Obviously, IMF has a key leadership on uh, debt um, on debt rating and incorporating climate risk in debt assessment. And Club of Paris, they have a very good experience on debt for environment swap. They should be the one leading uh, on debt for climate swaps, mainly on biodiversity and and fast mitigation strategies. And we do need, we also need to develop at the same time blueprints, first movers, champions. Um, China could be one with natural based solutions and, and the Amazon uh, strategy that Carlos presented. And again, the Club of Paris can, can do a lot on biodiversity and fast mitigation strategies, um, with also with Africa and Latin America. And um, thank you very much. This is our background note. You can access it in our web page, um, and um, and we're open, obviously, to, to any questions. Thank you so much, Romina. What a, a very comprehensive overview and very thought provoking. We have a a lot of uh, questions coming in. I'm going to move uh, quickly though uh, to our next speaker, and we're going to um, take as many questions as we can after our speakers uh, are done. Um, next, we have Eric Lecomte, the Executive Director of Jubilee USA Network. Um, Eric's uh, testimonies to Congress formed the basis of emergency debt legislation and tax and trade policies. He advised the United Nations Assembly process on global bankruptcy last year. Um, he addressed the United Nations General Assembly on debt relief responses to the global climate crisis. We're very excited to have you with us today. Eric, the floor is yours. Thank you. It's so good to be with all of you today. Uh, and I appreciate um, uh, the other uh, presentations. Uh, I think some of the other presenters have um, looked at a, a number of issues in terms of the global debt crisis, as well as the challenges we face and some of the solutions. Um, one of the solutions that has been highlighted uh, are um, debt swaps. Um, and in, in my presentation today, what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about where some of the opportunities are um, for the climate adaptation and mitigation discussion. Um, right now, where decisions are being made that influence this discussion, both in terms of funding debt swaps, but looking also much more broadly uh, at the need for climate adaptation and mitigation policies uh, and where we really need to be advocating for them and our objectives right now. Um, next slide. So the, the challenge uh, in front of us as, as we approach it is looking at the reality that the North owes a debt to the South. Uh, what we call, what Pope Francis calls, uh, what, what people have been calling for the last 15 years, the idea of climate debt. Uh, but the reality because uh, of the North taking resources uh, from the South to fuel consumption and the industrialization process, conditions were created um, for uh, climate change, um, thus spurring greater inequality uh, as well as pushing forward more extreme uh, natural disasters. Uh, southern countries have fewer resources to deal with these events, uh, as well as the shocks that are caused by climate change, like hurricanes, forest fires, viral outbreaks. So we really begin this conversation with the sense that uh, because of this, um, the North owes a debt to the South. Uh, climate adaptation and mitigation uh, will call for a very large uh, investment, uh, and in according to a good report, 
Nick Stearns from Brookings in 2016 and uh, some other amazing economists and thinkers uh, of all that was needed before the pandemic struck in terms of climate adaptation and mitigation, 70% of those resources uh, need to go to Southern countries. Uh, next slide. Um, and I think in this moment, there is an opportunity. Uh, I think we've heard how extreme the crisis is on climate issues, um, which also is impacting uh, labor issues, uh, production issues, uh, and the reality uh, that we've seen right now, 265 million people uh, move um, into the ranks of experiencing famine around the world. Uh, 80 million of those people in Latin America, according to the United Nations. So these issues are incredibly serious. Um, we are in a moment, we believe that similar to after the last financial crisis where there was a period where world leaders were starting to ask big questions and considered more bold proposals. Um, so in the face of the coronavirus pandemic, um, we see that um, there is the opportunity um, for debt and global financial architecture processes uh, to be evaluated. They are being evaluated. Uh, there are conversations about creating new, new resources um, and those new resources that are going to be created could and should include climate adaptation, mitigation and protection efforts. Uh, next slide. So here are the, the, the the five areas that I just kind of want to walk through today in terms of where there are uh, discussions in terms of looking at climate debt relief and financing as a crisis response. Um, some of it is going to be alluding to some more technical pieces. Um, some others are, are more broader pieces. Uh, I think all of these offer all of us um, an important chance for advocacy um, now and, and definitely through the next year as many of these decisions will be made in some way. So the five target areas that I'm going to discuss are first the IMF and World Bank. Um, second, looking at um, debt con contracts. Um, the reality that private debt um, is essentially under jurisdictions. The majority of which, uh, is in the state of New York then the United Kingdom, and then Germany, France, Singapore, Japan. But changing those debt contracts, um, looking at clauses in terms of being able uh, to move forward climate debt relief uh, responses, as well as climate mitigation and adapt adaptation efforts. Um, I, next, I'm going to look at the United Nations financing for development process. I'm going to look at one particular proposal that's been discussed and lifted by Caribbean countries in response to the climate crisis. Um, I want to note some of the issues and opportunities that are before the G7 and G20 and, and what's at stake if we don't intervene with the decisions they're making right now on debt. Um, and then finally, uh, I want to really turn to, uh, I, I think, a very serious issue and one that I'm uh, unsure of how much focus is on, but that's looking at the Amazon region government debt levels and also among some of those governments, the stimulus packages that governments have generated, uh, which are quite significant. Um, and there needs to be a climate mitigation and adaptation focus that's advocated on the ground in these countries in terms of moving forward some solutions. Um, next uh, uh, slide, please. Um, so the IMF and World Bank, um, you know, we very are likely approaching uh, a new wave of global debt restructuring, debt restructurings. Um, climate mitigation and adaptation uh, is really missing from IMF supported debt restructurings and analysis. Um, so right now, as we have this wave of debt restructurings that will go forward, where processes are being determined now on how those processes are going to work, uh, there isn't um, a strong lens that um, looks at how fiscal plans are lined with requirements of mitigation and adaptation um, or looking at how climate resilience of public investments um, should be a part of a growth path analysis. Uh, if, if these lenses start to be included, what it means is that um, a country has the opportunity in a restructuring to capture more debt relief uh, specifically for climate adaptation and mitigation. Um, what is happening at the International Monetary Fund right now um, is they have had a pilot uh, process 
which is just for a small handful of countries, um, which is looking at climate change uh, policy uh, assessments. So essentially advising governments on how to start to look at climate change. But it really doesn't represent anything that's binding uh, only for a small subset uh, of countries. Uh, I think there's also a reality that, uh, as we've seen from the most recent report on the International Monetary Fund, the Global Financial Stability Report, um, they are wading into the debate of how climate risks impact the global financial regulatory agenda and system. Um, this is also another really important way um, to, I think, intersect to push executive directors and push the IMF. Um, because no matter what your position is on IMF involvement, they're going to continue to look at a lens in this report for the upcoming reports as well. Um, and what that lens looks like um, is something that could help us, something we can cite, and being able to influence it, again, um, actually has an impact um, on the global climate change agenda within the financial system. Uh, a, a few other issues that I want to, um, to note because I think they're important. Um, a big part of the global conversation right now and something that's happening uh, within the G20 um, that um, the head of the IMF has called for uh, is a, a new allocation um, of special drawing rights. Um, there are also existing special drawing rights. So I, I want to just note those in, in kind of two buckets. So right now, processes are moving forward in the IMF of uh, how countries might allocate or distribute $176 billion in resources. So far of that existing allocation, um, a few billion have gone to uh, concessional lending processes. Uh, I think behind the scenes at the IMF, there's a move to try and increase that with existing special drawing rights uh, donations. Uh, but the reality is, uh, is that um, a realm uh, for existing donations to be donated uh, to um, a climate debt swap facility, for example. Um, and this was referenced as an idea back in 2010 by the IMF in a staff paper. Um, and right now, I think in the broader debt discussion, we're looking at how you use um, existing special drawing rights and new allocations of, of special drawing rights actually to fund a number of initiatives. Um, so it's something that should be on the agenda. Now the bigger bucket is the special drawing rights new allocation where uh, many world leaders, uh, economists like Joseph Stiglitz have called for a trillion dollar allocation um, uh, but uh, we've seen uh, the UN conference uh, on trade and development, uh, other policy groups um, push for up to two trillion. Uh, and right now, in terms of a lot of our work we're doing at Jubilee, we're looking at a three trillion dollar allocation in terms of actually meeting the need of the liquidity crisis because that would mean right away a trillion dollars without any extra donation would go to developing uh, countries, both low income and the middle income ones, um, which are in the Amazon region. Um, with this money, there is no, um, uh, essentially once it goes to a central bank, it could be spent in any way. So this is another place to advocate that money should be going to facilities um, that help move forward uh, in the Amazon region, uh, climate mitigation, adaptation and protection. Um, so those are some of the pieces in front of the IMF and World Bank that I, I are relevant to intersect in um, right now. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the next piece, and, and this uh, it has to go uh, with something I'll also address a little bit later, but uh, the reality when we talk about talking about different types of debt, different types of actors, we have uh, public debt uh, institutions um, like development banks, like the International Monetary Fund, like governments, uh, and more and more in terms of debt, and this is true um, for at least four countries we've looked at in the Amazon region, um, their biggest concerns are actually with uh, private debt and the private debt crisis, uh, meaning that it's from um, corporations, from businesses, from commercials. Um, and certainly um, all of the countries, and we won't be able to go into details, there are different things that are impacting them um, and the crises aren't exactly the same in uh, the countries we've looked at. But I, I think it is important to note um, that the private sector debt is an issue. 
So 51% of the world's private debt is contracted under um, US law. About another 45% is under UK law. Uh, the rest is between five or six other countries. Um, and so those contracts, um, uh, as we learned from the Argentina crisis, where um, for years uh, in a court battle in New York State, a contract on their debt was being determined for what a collective action clause meant, who would include it in a restructuring. Um, so these contracts are going to continue. Um, there's a big move in the financial system to improve collective action clauses. Um, we're seeing new collective action clauses in recent years uh, that are hurricane clauses first introduced uh, in the Grenada debt restructuring uh, about six years ago that are now not perfect, but being adapted, but essentially allows a payment um, moratorium on debt um, in order to be able to deal with um, funding relief efforts to immediately go into place when a hurricane or other natural disaster hits. Um, we also have GDP um, uh, uh, collective action clauses that we're now actually seeing uh, emerge uh, in the Puerto Rico debt restructuring. Uh, but looking at uh, creditors are paid more if an economy is growing and thriving. Um, so linking payments to actually the success of an economy uh, as opposed to just taking from the economy no matter what's happening with that particular economy. And so within this, um, you know, we believe there are actually rooms for climate mitigation, climate adaptation, and burdening uh, clauses uh, that can start to be introduced to contracts that would offer uh, relief and financing uh, for mitigation and adaptation when we need it. Um, so a little bit esoteric, but I think really critical when we're looking at four of the countries in the Amazon region, not looking at a public uh, debt crisis or a public and private, but solely a private debt crisis. Uh, next slide. Eric, just one moderator moment. I mean, I could listen to you all day. We have, you're a little over 15 minutes and I'd love uh, to hear from Kevin and still have some time for questions. So just, just a note, if you could, I know you still have several more slides, yeah, but. Sure, no, thank you um, very much. Um, so, uh, I, I think the presentation will be shared. Um, the next slide looks like there's a, a, a bit of a, um, a, a problem with it, but there's the United Nations Financing for Development process. Now there's a broad debt agenda um, that is being moved through that process, all of which could or should have uh, climate adaptation components to them. Um, right now, many of them don't. I, I won't get into that broader agenda, but I will talk about um, a proposal that has been lifted by Caribbean governments and small island development states behind the scenes. Um, and that's to look as, at, as the climate is driving more extreme um, disasters um, that uh, the South is experiencing, uh, a disaster could trigger uh, essentially a, a debt relief process and a bankruptcy or debt restructuring process. Um, so this is kind of a, looking at a, a post way of, of dealing with the challenges. Um, next slide. So I, I would also just note that the G7 and G20 um, are important places where these discussions uh, are moving forward. And many of these decisions over the next year will only really be made at, at the G20, um, given that uh, they control the voting shares uh, at the IMF. Um, and, and given that um, right now, the processes are moving because of like lack of global financial architecture um, in their groups and subgroups. Um, so the G7 Canadian presidency did look at that last proposal and brought it to the G7, um, but didn't move forward with something quite as robust. Uh, I think the other place that I would just note um, is that it is important um, for the climate movement and for all of us to be in 20 infrastructure agenda, uh, because a, a large part of what could happen with adaptation and mitigation uh, is about making infrastructure sustainable and resilient. Um, there's also the reality uh, that the G20, G20 quality infrastructure investment principles shapes and influences all multilateral development banks. So it's a very important place for us to be bringing this agenda. Uh, next slide. Um, so this just brings to something that uh, it brings us to something that I, I really thought was important to um, to highlight, 
um, especially among partners uh, around this particular conversation. Um, so when we look at the countries that are facing debt crisis or uh, high debt distress, uh, public and or private, we're looking at Venezuela, Ecuador, Suriname, Guyana, Bolivia, Colombia, and Brazil. Um, Bolivia, Colombia, and Brazil are, are at risk of uh, private debt crisis, part of what I had raised earlier. Um, so just because of the, the, this global pandemic um, and the extreme economic change uh, that countries are experiencing, um, among the Amazon, these Amazon region countries, except for Guyana, uh, their uh, losses or contradictions in GDP range from 26% to 7%. At the same time, um, we do have countries that are doing massive stimulus packages during this time that are being generated now, will be spent once over the next few years, and will be gone forever. Some of the examples, just as percentages of GF GDP to show that this is hundreds of billions of dollars of money, uh, is you know Ecuador, Brazil, Peru, Bolivia, you can see against the broader size of their economy how big their stimulus packages are. So I, I think the final question that I want to leave us with in this area is with hundreds of billions of stimulus, um, are recovery packages aligned uh, with regional Amazon protection initiatives and climate objectives, uh, including debt swaps and broader mitigation policies? Um, I, I think that's a really serious question right now is these governments, again, will spend hundreds of billions of dollars in stimulus. Um, next slide. So, uh, you know, in closing, um, I think we've all gone over really how, how terrible this crisis um, for all of us, the entire world, the poor, the developing world, as well as for the environment. Uh, and so I leave us with a challenge. Um, someone who wrestled with that debt crisis we talked about earlier, Grenada, recovering from hurricanes, uh, when he said to the World Bank um, after the terrible 2017 hurricanes, a crisis is a terrible thing to waste. Uh, there is a reality that right now, um, we have opportunities amidst this crisis, and it's incumbent upon us to be able to not only win the broader relief measures that can address extreme poverty, but also link the lenses and measures we need to move forward our climate agenda. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much, um, Eric. And um, for those who are interested, there is a, a policy tracker to your last question of, you know, where is the stimulus money going? Is it addressing this critical, these critical issues in the Amazon? Um, a tremendous um, uh, piece of work that's being done and updated constantly from around the world on where stimulus money is actually going relative to uh, fossil fuels and energy um, that has been produced by the ISD and many others. I'll put a link to it in the chat. Finally, um, we have Kevin Gallagher, the director of the Global Development Policy Center at Boston University's Party School of Global Studies. Um, Kevin has a, a long history in working on these issues um, at the G20 and Committee on Development Pro Policy and at the United Nations. Um, and thank you so much for joining us, Kevin. The floor is yours. Thanks. It's uh, great to be on this panel and to uh, and to be part of this re important and super salient uh, discussion. Given given that we're a little short on time, and I really want to make sure we have a discussion, I'll skip the PowerPoint and try to just uh, try to just cut to the chase here. You know, sometimes um, sometimes folks in the environmental community see lots of economic growth and prosperity as sometimes fundamentally at odds with, uh, with the environment. But one of the things that we're learning now is that downturns and especially crises can be worse. When countries are desperate for the fiscal space like we are right now to attack this virus, to protect the vulnerable, and then try to put together a sustainable recovery, uh, countries uh, for good reason are just looking around for any kind of short-term economic activity uh, to be able to meet those goals. And unfortunately, especially in a, in a time when there's lots of external get debt, they look for those areas of the economy that can be sold off internationally to be able to pay back those debts and get that fiscal space. So in Ecuador, Peru, and other countries in the Amazon, that means pressure on oil concessions, hydropower projects, and other forms of expansion into the Amazon, 
which is of course the source of livelihoods for people, uh, the main source of biodiversity for local and national ecosystems, and the carbon sink for all of us. And so this pressure is what Carlos Larraia called uh, deep extractivism, is what the first thing that many of these countries in the region have to fall back on, because unfortunately for longer term structural reasons, this is all they have to offer the world economy at this point in time. Yesterday, I was on a panel with Jeffrey Akimoto, the first deputy managing director of the International Monetary Fund and former member of the Trump administration's uh, Treasury Department. And he gave us uh, uh, an inkling of what the projections for economic growth will be when they announce them in two weeks for Latin America. And the IMF predicts a 9% contraction in economic growth for Latin America in 2020. If you translate that into per capita terms, that brings Latin America back to where they were in 2010. So that's a lost decade, another lost decade. The past three out of the four last, have been last decades in terms of economic growth for the region. The only period where there was really sustained economic growth that was any bigger than from the period from 1950 to or the early 1980s was the early 2000s, which many of us call the China boom, which was good for economic growth and some countries were able to use some of that windfall profit to protect the poor, but unfortunately it also accentuated the environment and many of you on this call will probably see, would probably see that as a lost decade as well. On Monday, my center, the Global Development Policy Center is going to release something called the IMF COVID-19 Recovery Index and we measure all of the hundred programs that have been out so far on the extent to which they uh, encourage health spending to attack the virus, social spending to uh, protect the vulnerable, and financing for a green recovery. Uh, as Eric said, uh, and I've written about this too, although the IMF does not have enough resources to deal with this crisis, it needs a stepwise increase in resources. We find for now that on two of the three of those things, the IMF is doing a surprisingly good job with the limited amount of resources that it has. First of all, most of the programs, all but 13, uh, do not have any fiscal conditionalities as they have in the past. They're all relatively flexible programs. Unfortunately, one of the most strict programs is Ecuador's, which is of course in the heart of, uh, heart, heart of the Amazon. Secondly, uh, almost all the programs are really promoting health spending to attack the virus and social spending to deal with the vulnerable. This stands in stark contrast if you study the past of the International Monetary Fund, which often say cut health spending, cut social spending. Now, the IMF managing director, Kristalina Gorgieva, has been out there almost being one of the world's thought leaders on the need for a green recovery. Unfortunately, we find that the, that the green recovery part of these programs is minuscule at best. Uh, we only find a handful of uh, programs where it's really encouraged. In, uh, we do find in the programs for Bahamas and the Bangladesh that the IMF is encouraging and supporting adaptation finance, but by and large, uh, they're indicating that this liquidity should liquidate nat nat natural assets across the world. What is worse, one of the other things that the first deputy managing director, Okamoto, said yesterday, he said Latin America should spend as much as they can now with these programs, but he said, and I quote, keep the receipts. What he meant by keeping the receipts is that the need for fiscal consolidation, the IMF's term for austerity, is right around the corner. And so rather than this being a good step in the right direction for the IMF, and then we get them more resources and they continue to practice what they preach in terms of health, social spending and the environment, they are not gonna have as much resources as they need. And they're st gonna start advising countries and conditioning countries to start that fiscal consolidation period, which will only accentuate uh, this desperation finance and put the region, especially the countries we're concerned about on this webinar, uh, more into a, a deep extractive mode. And I just have to note, being an American, that couldn't be more hypocritical, right? Here in the United States and across the advanced economies, we're printing every dollar or euro or yen that we can, and we're borrowing lots and lots of debt at, at, at percentages of the GDP way higher than many countries in the South uh, to be able to stimulate our economies. But the IMF is on the verge of, uh, of going back to where it was and focusing on fiscal consolidation. As we speak, according to CEPAL or the Economic Commission on Latin America and Caribbean, countries across the region are ranging from 20 to 70% 
of all government revenue right now is going to service external debt payments. What is needed now is fiscal space so countries can attack the virus and, and protect the poor immediately and then start to mount a sustainable and inclusive uh, uh, recovery, not dollars to pay foreign debt now and to sell off the environment later. We need a comprehensive five point plan to really be able to give countries the fiscal space that we need. Number one, to echo what Eric and everyone else in the world, except for the United States government is saying, we need a massive new allocation of special drawing rights in the world economy. Number two, we need to expand the debt suspension sustainability, excuse me, debt service sustain, uh, suspension in, uh, initiative or the DSSI to middle income countries and to climate vulnerable countries. Number three, we need substantial debt relief, not just suspension of payments, but actual haircuts across the world. Developing countries need to be able to focus on the poor and to mount sustainable recoveries. The Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean has a very specific proposal about this for small island uh, developing countries in Latin America that face uh, climate vulnerabilities, mainly island states in the Caribbean that are suffering from, from climate shocks. They're calling for a 12.2% reduction in the overall level of debt and the creation of an adaptation fund. We need something like that for the Amazon. Number four, and perhaps this is the most important, we need meaningful participation by the private sector in these efforts, including rules that make sure that credit rating agencies don't downgrade countries for doing the right thing. And fifth, and this is a really important for people on this call, we need civil society and governments and the international community to make sure that we have accounting and monitoring systems to make sure that any sorts of relief, any sorts of new finance goes towards attacking the virus, protecting people and putting forth a green recovery. But unfortunately, we can't wait for all that. Like Eric said, like Uli says, it's really important for all of us to act, think globally, act locally and act globally. We have to be working in these multilateral, uh, multilateral forums, uh, but developing countries, civil societies have very little voice in that. That doesn't mean we have to stop. We need to create coalitions and think about new ways uh, to be able to do this. Uh, but we also need to act locally. And so the kinds of initiatives that we heard from Carlos Barrea and from Marina Picolote, these are important things that we need to try to get off the ground at the national level uh, now. Um, and perhaps in Carlos's case, uh, we, we saw some, we saw, early, or saw uh, earlier this week some real leadership in, in the global community on climate change and with respect to China. We know that next year they are hosting the Convention on Biological Diversity. What's great about Ecuador is that unfortunately it is highly debt distressed. It's really having a trouble with the virus. It has a number of poor people. It also has plenty of biodiverse forest that could be protected, which could help those people, help stop the virus, and help enhance biodiversity and protect the climate all at the same time. So if, uh, if there's any advice to give to China, if they were gonna do some kind of an instrument and start somewhere, I'd start in Ecuador. So finally on next steps, I urge and plead with everyone to work on, a work on the global level in the ways that Eric and Uli Volz talked about. It's imperative, especially from a climate change perspective, that the, we need some sort of systemic changes. So everyone needs to be thinking globally and acting globally. We also have to be thinking locally and acting locally. And that's the second thing we need to do. We need to work at the, at the local level and at the national level to make sure governments can get whatever fiscal space they can to be able to protect the poor, attack the virus and mount a green recovery. And we need to hold them accountable for that. And some of these debt for nature swap instruments can be part of that kind of a package. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Kevin. So much in such a short and condensed period of time. Um, you know, it, this panel um, could be and probably should be um, a day long or several day long uh, conference. There are so many important concepts here uh, for moving forward. I'm going to propose uh, that a number of the questions that we've seen in the chat, our team uh, will work with the panelists um, to uh, develop more comprehensive answers after the webinar. And when we send out the link to everyone who's registered in the web webinar, we can also send out some more comprehensive answers. A number of amazing questions and important conversation in the chat. We have, unfortunately, six minutes left. 
what I'm going to do is I'm going to flag a couple of them and then do a quick go around a couple minutes for each of our panelists to address what they'd like to address um, before we leave. Um, so to Kevin, the last question um, that came in um, most recently um, is uh, specifically um, on um, uh, demand driven um, peak, uh, peak oil, many people are talking about, including BP um, uh, this year as a result in part of COVID. Um, but the question specifically is around, um, besides debt swaps and considering that most industry funding uh, comes from global financial centers, would you see banning capital inflows, preventing the oil industry from funding, for funding an alternative? Um, uh, there are a number of questions I want to um, flag for Carlos and Romina about Ecuador. How can this debt for nature plan go along with the work to diversify the economy of Ecuador to move away from dependence on extraction and exploitation? Ex I think that's exploitation. Um, and just a reminder to people that amazing work is going on with Indigenous Nations visions and um, in, co in collaboration with a number of Indigenous Nations through the Amazon Sacred Headwaters Initiative. Um, and I urge you to take a look at that. A question of whether or not we're seeing this proposal or this idea be discussed um, with the Ecuador intelligentsia. Are there relationships with them? Are they actually looking at anything like this? Um, uh, just checking if there is anything big that I missed in those questions. Um, well, that's a lot, and I'm sure people, well, debt swap specific, um, we had some great questions around how can we make this interesting <laughs> for creditors? And then, of course, um, to Carlos, um, Kevin, and others, a number of questions about China. Um, will China, um, how, can we, how can we help ensure that China becomes a champion on these nature-based solutions? Um, I've heard a lot of people uh, talking about the fact that it seems like the right hand's not talking to the left hand. Um, China has done some incredible climate commitments here at Climate Week. And of course, we've um, heard um, uh, many visions uh, from China about the ecological civilization. Um, is this actually going to be possible that China will lead? Um, so big, big questions. Sadly, not a lot of time um, going to uh, do a final go around if you can stick with us to the end of our go around. I hope you can. Really excited to see so many participants have stuck with us for the full hour and a half. Thank you so much. So I'm just going to go across my screen here um, uh, and ask uh, Romina if you'd like uh, uh, to give us some final comments. Yeah. Um, well, we have. Thank you for all the, all the questions. And, um, I mean, I think there were a lot of questions about China, and um, one thing that is happening is the EU-China dialogue, high-level dialogue at this moment. So, it will be very important to influence that as basically a dialogue with main creditors. Um, I think China can lead the way on nature-based solution, but also will need uh, the debtor countries to uh, request this. So to work with um, the countries that are part of the Amazon Basin, to work with countries in Africa, um, I think is, is crucial. And, um, and promote this dialogue from the debtor side as well. Um, so it's not only a creditor driven uh, dialogue. So that will be my, my two cents. And this is a very important opportunity for the war. And I don't think we're going to have another opportunity like this one. Um, and I know the pandemic has caused a lot of suffering and it still is causing a lot of suffering. So it's, it's a time of deep reflection on how to avoid more suffering of the world and, and finally um, have a more balanced uh, global society. And uh, this is the moment. I don't think we're going to experience another moment like that in our generation. Thank you very much, Romina. Um, Eric, can I turn to you? Sure. I, I will. Um, uh, when someone else says uh, what you would say, uh, as the Quakers do in the United States, they simply say, friend speaks uh, my mind. So let me just offer that and then just offer the additional thought that um, this really is a moment um, if we really uh, work and focus where uh, we can impact global policies on the climate inequality and extreme poverty. Um, the urgency and the opportunity, uh, I believe, are unique in the lifetime of uh, lifetimes of many of us. 
Um, and uh, the reality is, uh, is the window is going to be short. Maybe it'll be a year to three years. But the further we get away from the crisis, uh, like the last financial crises, I believe world leaders um, will go back to status quo and business as usual. Um, Carlos, I should have also mentioned that there were a number of questions about how people can support um, Indigenous uh, visions and how could Indigenous peoples uh, benefit directly from some of these uh, arrangements. Um, I don't know if you caught those um, in the Q&A or in the chat, but um, I, I turn to you now for final comments. Uh, Carlos, you are muted. Thank you. Uh, well, first of all, uh, I think uh, this idea of a uh, debt for nature swap uh, can be uh, an, an initial part, a, a kind of sparking point uh, to develop a more um, comprehensive shift, including as, as an essential component, the respect and expansion of the indigenous perspective uh, of development, uh, the summa causa, the idea is uh, to change uh, the perspective and foster uh, our, uh, a more sustainable and equitable model of development in Ecuador. In Ecuador, we have uh, been working for a while on uh, expanding the economy, uh, basically mostly uh, on activities such as agroforestry, agroecology, uh, sustainable uh, nature based tourism and so on, then provide incentives to reaching at the same time a respect for nature, the conservation of indigenous cultures, and finally, an improving living conditions. I think the, 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 the way is feasible, uh, but it, it needs a, a, a changing in the viewpoint, a kind of new paradigm to do so. Thank you. Thank you, Carlos. And for those who weren't monitoring the chat, I'll just say it out loud. We'll hear from Carlos uh, again tomorrow in a webinar on the need for international cooperation uh, to align fossil fuel production uh, with a 1.5 uh, degree uh, world. You can find that on the Climate Week uh, program uh, website as well. Um, uh, Kevin, um, uh, I don't know um, if uh, you um, well, oh, the floor is open to what you want to say in conclusion, um, but there have been so many conversations and questions um, about the about the how and also um, about uh, China and, and, and next steps. I'm wondering if you could um, leave us with your final thoughts. Sure, let me, let me leave on China and just quickly answer the question that you asked me about in terms of should countries be regulating foreign investment? And the question to that is absolutely yes. This, that crisis is a function largely of very volatile short-term debt flows that went into the, the uh, private bond markets uh, across, across the region, largely because of monetary policy in the United States and the lack of discretion on the, point of, uh, on the part of Latin American governments. Um, so Latin American governments, as, as, as Eric says, we need quality and sustainable and resilient infrastructure across the world to make it resilient and more inclusive and 21st, built for the 21st century. And countries can't mobilize all that finance themselves. So foreigners, if they, if they want to finance it, that's great. Well, countries need to get more discretionary about attracting good foreign investment and mitigating and keeping out some of the negative of investment and, the, and that that really means being really careful about the short-term highly volatile stuff and over time to shift away from fossil fuels but we can't be naive about this particular region where because of structural reasons some of it going back to colonialism there isn't another alternative for some of this foreign exchange so we also have to be really focused on just transitions in these countries that we don't leave the people who are in and around some of these fossil fuel intensive sectors uh, uh, behind so definitely, yes, there needs to be regulation. There needs to be international alignment along this too. I know Brooke Gubin is uh, one of the people on this call and many of the trade and investment treaties that the United States has with Ecuador, with Peru, make it difficult to make that kind of discretion. And we need to reform those as well. Now on China, I, to make a plug, uh, I, I sit uh, on the international team leader of, the, of a joint commission with the Ministry of Environment in China uh, for, the, for the green BRI. And last week, we 
put out our special policy study on greening the BRI with respect to SDG 15. Um, and in that study, uh, I'll, if we have any time, I'll, I'll put it in the chat. Uh, maybe Maureen, if you're there, you can, you can put that on the chat. Um, we have a whole section in there about debt, debt for nature swaps. And China has an incredible dom uh, domestic experience with dealing with nature in the same way it, it is starting to on climate change with its pioneering ecological redlining approach. But, and Romina mentioned this, and China is very explicit about this, one of the great things about China's foreign policy, which is very different than some of these international institutions, is that it doesn't put conditionalities on domestic policies. And so the, you cannot rely on China to condition their finance on some of these kinds of things. However, if a host country asks and demands and puts it on the table, they're willing to negotiate. And that's important, right? Even though Ecuador has lots of uh, hydropower and oil concessions in Ramina's country, their country asked for one of the largest solar power plants in, in, in the region, and that's what they got. So China's not monolithic about this stuff. They're not gonna condition environmental policy on foreign investment. Uh, they've learned those lessons. They don't do that across the board, but let's hope that uh, policymakers in Ecuador listen to folks like Carlos Larea, and if Ecuador puts it on the table with China, let's hope they can also lead by example and be one of those first movers that Ramin is talking about. Thank you. Fantastic, thank you. Um, and um, Ulrich, you started us off. You get the last word uh, from the panel. You set the stage for the importance um, of the global importance um, on climate change um, and um, why this is uh, critical to address. I know um, we're all feeling the urgency uh, right now, um, especially given uh, the spends that, as Romina noted, um, will be uh, unprecedented in all of our lifetimes that will affect uh, where the future goes. So no pressure, um, but we're leaving you with the last word. Yeah, the floor. Yeah, well, well, thanks so much. It's been a fascinating discussion, and I really wish we had more time to. Uh, we have another time. Uh, well, let, let me reiterate this is absolutely a systemic crisis, so we do need uh, systemic solutions. We, we can't deal with piecemeal solutions. Um, I can also re uh, reiterate what, what everyone's been saying about the great urgency. Um, and uh, the historic experience with dealing with debt crisis is that uh, waiting uh, for debt crisis to, to uh, resolve themselves never worked out. So we really need to, to tackle the debt crisis now. And given the uh, great urgency in dealing with the global climate crisis and the pandemic and the biodiversity crisis, um, the urgency is even greater. And um, so we have here a really, truly global challenge. None of these crises can be uh, dealt by any individual country alone. Um, and uh, so we really need world leaders to step up. We need the uh, uh, IMF uh, and World Bank membership, uh, and in particular, the, the uh, powerful G20 countries to really get going now, because we don't have uh, another half year or a year to, to, to waste. This really has to happen very soon um, so we need to 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 emphasize this urgency time and again and of course uh, nothing will work without involving the private sector and this is also one reason why we need to have a uh, an agreement among the leading countries to really put pressure on the private sector because otherwise it's not going to happen uh, not sure if that was kind of the the, the grand closing statement but um, uh, some uh, uh, points from me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ulrich. And I um, thank you um, uh, to the person who gave us the proper report. I've just sent it to all attendees in the chat. Um, there is the report uh, that uh, Kevin uh, mentioned earlier. Um, so um, this is, I think, um, uh, we all can see a very critical conversation, a very timely conversation. Um, uh, our organizations will be working uh, to uh, figure out how we can bring uh, this conversation forward um, and continue uh, to uh, enrich it in the, in the depth of it. Um, you know, this is the longest run up that any of us have ever had to a COP. 
Um, so we still have uh, another 14 months um, to uh, continue to work uh, together uh, to try and uh, develop this work. Um, I want to um, uh, mention again um, that there are um, uh, uh, a number of us exploring a related uh, proposal, which will be talked about tomorrow uh, on another webinar. I think it was quite astounding to many of us uh, to realize uh, that uh, the UNFCCC and the Paris Accord has very few mechanisms uh, to constrain the production uh, of oil, uh, gas, and coal. Um, so a number of academics um, and policymakers and advocates from around the world have come together to discuss um, whether we need a new parallel uh, initiative uh, to, because um, what we know is fossil fuels are 80% uh, of the climate problem. Um, yet from the production gap report that I mentioned at the beginning, we're on track to build 120% more than the world can safely burn. The intellectual capital, the political capital, the financial capital going up into continuing to expand oil, gas, and coal when we know we have enough currently under production and construction on the planet while we wind down um, is astounding. Um, so I urge you to take a look at fossilfueltreaty.org, the uh, International Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation uh, Init Treaty Initiative. Um, the fact is, we heard today that the world needs <clears throat> China, the IMF, and other major creditors to commit to implementing debt relief strategies for the future of our planet. The challenges before us are immense, um, but there's still time to turn these crises into opportunity. Thank you. I think it was Romina for noting that it's seven years and that clock is counting down. Then to reorient a major driver behind the problems we face. So thank you all for taking the time to learn about these critical issues. Uh, to our experts for joining us today to give us a little window um, into your research. We deeply uh, appreciate you all. Um, I hope you all enjoy uh, the rest of Climate Week. Thanks to Climate Group for convening all these very important conversations. Um, and uh, to all of us who joined us, uh, to all of you who joined us and, and stayed on for over an hour and a half, thank you so much for your time. We will send out some more answers and the recording from these questions. And uh, to everyone, uh, stay safe. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Take care. Thanks so much, Sipora, and thanks everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Take care.